last presentation was shit, okay? That's, <laughs> the, that's a pre-wreck. Um, um, and uh, it's quite a lot of familiar faces um, in the room, and for those who know me, yes, I'm not, I'm certainly not an industrial relations lawyer. Um, I try and stay well away from the law where possible, but um, today I want to talk to you about um, climate and industrial relations, and I think Naomi... I don't remember how this happened really, but I think you read something or you saw something and you asked me to come along, so... Um, and we, also, we tried to make a climate change claim in our last negotiations with the Department of Health uh -huh. and essentially got laughed out of the room on yeah. that one. Yes. So I think yeah, that's we need right. to hear from an expert. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, so hopefully I can help um, a little bit with that, or maybe not, but anyway. So in terms of what I want to talk to you about today, um, just going to that point that Naomi just made, which is what is the connection between industrial relations and climate change? I won't go through the science of climate change, but just making that link, I guess, is a starting point, which is helpful, hopefully, if you do want to raise clauses um, in, in different ways uh, and making that argument to management. And then just talk about the practice of industrial relations and climate change. Uh, and that primarily happens in two different ways. I'm talking about them as a bit distinct, but actually there's obviously a lot of crossover, but uh, attempts at green bargaining or climate bargaining and then pursuing a kind of wider political economic transformation which is around um, just transition and that's what I've been doing in the southwest of WA in Collie. Uh, so that's what we'll hopefully get through relatively uh, quickly but feel free to stop and ask me questions and I'll, I'll do my best to answer them as long as they're not legal questions. Okay so very quickly I've got one slide on kind of the science of climate change. Um, the image on uh, the right of the screen is um, probably an image you're all familiar with, but we've got sort of natural climate variation, and then we have observed uh, human-induced uh, climate uh, heating, and um, and if you weren't outside today, you would feel the joys of that heating. Um, and in fact, I saw a report that so Western Australia usually averages 26 or 27 uh, days above 35 degrees, and that's forecast to get to 40. Uh, by the middle of the 2030s. So, um, you know, this is, you know, weather and climate are not, you know, the same thing, but they are deeply uh, interlinked. So, um, the UN uh, has released a number of reports. The most recent of them is the sixth annual report, and it looks at the physical science of climate change, the impacts and adaption towards climate change and climate mitigation, and, you know, basically reaches conclusions that we need to act um, urgently on climate change if we want to keep it to 1.5 to 2 degrees of warming. Um, although there are strong arguments to suggest that we might have already exceeded 1.5 degrees uh, of warming already. Um, so, you know, the, the science is clear and at present we're a long way from reaching those goals and that's kind of the point that the UN General Secretary made in 2022 about the fact that um, we're sort of sleepwalking into this pretty horrific situation and we're partly on the way there. And I guess the other point I like in that quote is that it uh, requires action from everyone, right? Obviously, nation states are fundamentally important here in the UN you know, climate negotiations, but it requires corporations, individuals, unions, and everyone to be discussing uh, these things. Uh, the reality is, though, that um, investment in fossil fuels grew by 6% last year, and Australia is one of the highest users of fossil fuels uh, in the world. So my students always tell me they feel depressed after in my class, so hopefully you have a similar experience. All right, so what's the link between climate change and industrial relations? Um, so we know fundamentally that if we want to have a stable climate, which is, you know, human flourishing over the last 250, 300 years, largely because we have a very stable climate, if we want to try and maintain a level of climate stability, we need to destroy uh, the fossil fuel economy. And that has all sorts of implications, fairness implications, industry implica implications, job implications, and all of those sorts of things, right? So we've kind of got this puzzle. And uh, I lent a little bit on the harvester decision in, in the end of that quote about, so how do we, in the process of destroying um, the fossil fuel economy, ensure we continue, um, people continue to thrive, sustain themselves, their families, have a basic standard of living, um, frugal comfort in uh, Justice Higgins' terms, obviously. So we've got that puzzle that we're working with. And if we think about industrial relations um, and, I guess, uh, some of the most militant unions, unions who have driven um, you know, workers' rights 
and improvements in wages and conditions, work hours, health and safety, all those sorts of things, a lot of them come out of and are deeply connected to the fossil fuel uh, industry. So the industrial relations system has deep carbon intensive foundations. Uh, we also know we have this need uh, for climate action. Um, and this article by Thomas said is kind of making the same kind of point that it was mining, coal mining in particular, um, that drove um, sort of the, the, the lead frontier in terms of industrial relations improvements and working for uh, pushing for workers' rights um, through the industrial relations systems in particularly in advanced capitalist economies like Australia, Great Britain, Western Europe, the United States, uh, and so forth. So, um, in this context, um, we know that we have to weaken high carbon systems and encourage low carbon uh, system growth. And the question becomes, how do we support workers and unions and industries who have traditionally been the drivers of improved industrial relations conditions? Um, we have to weaken the industries in which they're involved, and we also have to grow and encourage the development of low carbon industries um, and uh, the workers attached to, and, and the job opportunities there. But the thing I, I often get concerned about from people outside the union movement and outside kind of thinking about workers' rights and interests um, is they often present this transition as you know, this very rosy thing and you know, there'll be all these jobs and it'll be great. Um, but I think we have to be pretty upfront about some of the challenges and risks about this transition for workers, for industry, for unions. And I've just listed some of um, the risks and challenges um, associated uh, with those things. So obviously, number one, and you know, we see it in coal mining, we see it in uh, oil and gas industry and other industries, uh, job losses, right? Now, of course, job losses are happening for various reasons uh, beyond climate change, but job losses are obviously a key factor. Another is uh, the changing nature of work, whether that's skills, uh, intensification, um, the types of uh, job opportunities and skills that might be associated with that, um, a loss of, of pay and conditions. So we know in the renewable energy sector, um, wages and conditions are, are often not as uh, good as the traditional energy industries of the oil and gas and, and coal-fired power, electricity and so forth. Um, so the argument, you know, you just transition to a, you know, the renewable energy industry, well, there's a loss of pay and conditions there, so that's not, you know, this question of fairness is important again. Um, industry changes. So I was doing a report uh, at the end of last year for the ILO, and something I hadn't really thought about too much um, was uh, the changing nature of car manufacturing, just as an example. So EVs are much more modular, uh, a lot less labour actually required to put an EV together. And so unions in Korea are in kind of uh, an argument fight with Hyundai around you know, the, the loss, the shredding of jobs in, in that industry and trying to ensure workers you know, are given opportunities in the EV manufacturing space and new batteries and those sorts of things. So the changing nature of industry as well. And then this question around reinforcing inequalities and, and disciplining labour. So much of the discussion around climate change and industrial relations for obvious reasons has focused on you know, white blue collar workers, right, and they're the ones at the, the front line. Um, not much of a conversation around existing industries, female dominated industries, uh, opportunities for um, you know, vulnerable communities or people who have been often uh, ignored within industrial relations such as indigenous communities around how they get um, brought into this uh, discussion as well. And then discipline labour, this is just giving you a, a small example I saw in Canada when I was living there. So uh, in Toronto, the transport, um, the TTC, Toronto Transport, whatever, I can't remember, um, was in a dispute with its workers and the union took uh, industrial action. And one of the arguments or the strategies of management in that case was to put out a kind of public relations campaign about how the union's industrial action was um, environmentally uh, destructive because it was not allowing workers to use you know, low emission public transport. So, it's an interesting way in which industrial action gets used against workers through a green kind of lens. So just, I thought it was an interesting example. And obviously, of course, you know, the work environment is changing because of the changing nature um, of, of the climate. So extreme heat, floods, etc., etc. So those are some of the challenges I think we can identify uh, around climate change. If we do nothing, 
many of those challenges uh, exist uh, anyway. Now, I normally put this slide up for a non-Australian audience, um, so I don't feel like I need to spend much time on this, but if we think about these forces, the kind of industrial, uh, fossil fuel foundation of industrial relations, and we think about the, the context in which we're operating, and the fact that in Australia, essentially, um, we've kind of been ignoring these interrelationships between these two things, and to date, the outcome of that has been Australia's emissions not going down, and in fact, in West Australia growing quite significantly. And also, for workers who are losing their jobs or their industries are being transformed, particularly in those kind of frontline ones in the energy sector, we've seen primarily disorderly and disruptive transition, which is not uh, good for the workers involved. So, to date, um, we're kind of pretending these forces uh, don't exist, broadly speaking. So we need to do much better. So looking at some kind of practical attempts uh, to bring environmental issues, climate issues, kind of directly into the practice uh, of industrial relations brings me to these sort of two ideas, uh, green bargaining and, uh, and just transition. Okay. So on the screen here, I've given you some topics um, that we've found in enterprise agreements um, in Australia, Canada, uh, and the UK. Uh, and you know, some of them are of very general nature, uh, some of them are much more uh, specific. And um, if you want to look at uh, a useful resource, I've put a link on the slide that I'm assuming you'll get a copy of these slides something will happen that you'll get them. But um, you can go to this uh, website, so it's through the University, uh, York University in Toronto, Canada, uh, which is where I spent some time. Um, the research project no longer exists, it's finished now, but the resource or the library for green causes uh, still exists. I checked it just the other day to make sure that's true. Um, and you can find exam or, you know, example causes from Canada and Australia, primarily, uh, for these sorts of different things. But the three, I think three, that I've highlighted on the screen are training um, workplace environmental community and green representative rights. I've highlighted those because, um, you know, when you're running an enterprise um, strategy, enterprise agreement making strategy, you've got your log of claims, um, you know, there's different ways to go about these things, but usually uh, trying to embed a particular right uh, around these issues um, can be a more fruitful way, longer term, to bringing uh, climate environment discussions into the workplace, into the industrial relations kind of toing and froing of management and workers. So obviously training and education, it can be a range of different things. It might be uh, about um, bringing uh, knowledge around auditing um, practices when it comes to environmental issues. Um, it might be information raising, whatever it could be. Um, a workplace environmental committee operating a little bit like occupational health and safety committees or similar sorts of things where you have representatives um, from the union, um, often from management, etc. as well, but discussing um, workplace issues, health issues, environmental issues um, on a regular basis. And then finally, again, like occupational health and safety uh, rights, green representative rights where a trained uh, union member um, can raise issues, problems, solutions uh, with management around environmental issues uh, in the workplace. So this list is drawn from uh, a review of enterprise agreements 2006 to 2014. So DWA um, and federally in the Australian context used to track green clauses and then um, the Abbott government got elected and they stopped tracking them. So, um, but. Let me show you a couple of different examples of uh, different clauses um, from both Australia uh, and Canada around these sorts of things. So the first one is sort of that joint information sharing. You know, it's not particularly sexy or exciting, but it's a starting point um, around, you know, in this context, the University of Melbourne uh, having to provide information to its uh, workforce around various environmental issues. Uh, the second one comes from um, the Canadian Auto Workers 
Um, what's interesting when I reviewed the data, maybe it's not surprising, but um, it is more green causes are certainly prevalent in white collar uh, workplaces. Why is that the case? The employer probably thinks it has less to lose potentially in that circumstance, probably thinks the environment is kind of a side issue, um, maybe level of engagement from you know key leaders within the organisation, workers in the organisation maybe is driving it. That's certainly the case within the NTU, but um, yeah, just an interesting observation. So then the second one, yeah, so green representative rights, um, so paid time off, again, a little bit like potentially health and safety rights um, to give um, CWU representatives um, in the shop floor or on the shop floor uh, time off and ability to do those things. And then uh, the final one is sort of more procurement kind of approach um, to green rights or green bargaining, again, at a university uh, in Australia. And I thought, I hadn't looked at these for quite some time, so I did this research seven or eight years ago, and there's a lot of words on the screen, yeah, I apologise, but I went and had a look at Macquarie University, because they were one of the uh, more prominent um, uh, branches in the NTU trying to push for green rights, and they have this fairly long clause now, but the highlighted bit um, at the bottom is sort of additional things that have been added over the last seven or, or eight years. Um, and so this agreement was just done in 2023, so relatively recent. Um, again, you know, giving a level of um, rights consultation, I know that's always a vexed issue, but um, information sharing and, um, and also um, giving uh, representation or rights to the NTU specifically uh, around uh, environmental issues in their uh, clause. Of course, one of the major limitations of many of these clauses, and I'm sure as industrial officers you're well aware of this, um, is that it's good to have a right in an enterprise agreement, whether it gets used, whether there's any accountability, and whether it leads to anything actually happening is, of course, the other uh, side of the coin. And in reviewing, particularly in the Australian case, a lot of energy was spent getting these clauses in, not much energy spent enforcing them, which is unionism 101 problems. All right. Um, so that's the Canadian and Australian approach to green bargaining that we've primarily seen in the Australian context. And there's debates and arguments, again, I'm, I'm not a, a labor lawyer, about um, getting these in agreements, if these clauses pertain to the employment relationship, should they actually be allowed to be in enterprise agreements? Um, and, and sometimes that's an easy maneuver for management to make to avoid putting these in um, enterprise agreements. I mean, the off the record conversation I've had with different people was that, you know, if management agrees to it, then the Fair Work Commission will tick it off essentially. All right, so in the UK, they took quite a different approach to trying to get green issues into the workplace. And I've used a very academic term, voluntary multilateralism, <laughs> to try and describe this, but essentially the TUC, the, you know, the equivalent of the ACTU in the UK, um, went to its affiliates and said, you know, we think we need to spend more time and energy focused on environmental um, issues in the UK. Um, we want our affiliates to go to your workplaces and, and have conversations with them to see, you know, is there an appetite amongst your membership? Are there champions within the workplace to engage in this? So that was the kind of first conversation that took place a willingness amongst uh, the membership and the affiliate union to engage with the challenge of environmental issues. Rather than going through an enterprise agreement kind of approach, they would then directly engage with management and say, management, you know, we think these are important issues and members have raised them. We would like to go through a kind of uh, consultative process with you, uh, maybe sign a member, memorandum of understanding, etc., around implementing environmental improvements in your workplace. Now, the way they pitched it um, was primarily kind of win-win, you know, uh, approach to the issue, which was, you know, this is uh, good for your workforce engagement, this is important to our members, but making these environmental improvements also improves your bottom line through, you know, better use of energy and 
resources and, and these sorts of things, which you know um, means it's a very narrow conversation that's going on in, in these cases. Nevertheless, um, these joint agreements or these workplaces and, and organisations who agree to it um, set up joint committees. Within these joint committees, um, they would have environmental training days. They would do joint uh, audits between um, elected um, green reps and management of how they could make improvements in the workplace. Um, they might set up an environmental committee, a little bit like was outlined in some of those enterprise agreements, develop kind of goals and um, proposals and then work towards them. And just at the bottom of the screen, you can see a few initiatives. So the TUC, and that figure will be much higher now, has trained um, over a thousand uh, green representatives, a little bit like an occupational health and safety training process. Um, where it outlines the rights of workers, to be honest, on the green side, not many, um, the kinds of issues you might want to raise with management, those sorts of things. And then the example at the bottom is kind of a, uh, an example of a green workplace initiative um, that the union went through with a brewery in Scotland, I think it was, or Wales, sorry, um, where they saw significant improvements in environmental outcomes. The problem with this approach, so this is a more a collaborative approach, the problem with this is it relies, one, on management buy-in, and usually um, what took place, much like in unions, there would be a manager who had a particular you know, want or need or you know, desire to see environmental improvement in their organisation. So they would engage, but that manager would leave, the new manager would come, and the whole thing would fall apart. So it was a lot of work and energy, and there was no actual rights embedded in that, that process. And so its sustainability is um, pretty questionable compared to the EBA. On the EBA side, getting those rights in the clause uh, in, in enterprise agreements are obviously excellent. Um, enforcing them and actually seeing tangible improvements um, was the major problem there. Any questions before I move on to just transition discussions? Tim. Uh, Caleb, perhaps this is more of an observation than a question, but... Um, you sound like an actor. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of my shtick. Um, so, it used to be that when we were talking about bargaining, mm. the big thing was supposed to be this is a productivity enhancing yeah. thing. We're all learning about ways in which we make our businesses work more efficiently, etc., etc. Now, I mean, the productivity discussion in Australia is so debased over the years that now productivity just means can your boss call you at midnight and should rich people get a tax cut? <laughs> but it does seem to me that what you're talking about with green workplace initiatives, mm. you're talking about you know, water usage drop, energy usage fall, heat bills cut. Um, on the previous one, you had things like flexible working, well-being. <coughs> All of these are arguably productivity improvements if you think about you know output per hour work at least it increases your productive capacity per hour and things like that has anybody tried to kind of repackage the environment environmental causes or environmental initiatives as productivity initiatives insofar as the classic if, if win-win means anything then this should be something that uh, lends itself to uh, firms that are actually bargaining. Yeah, I mean, the TUC, I don't remember them ever specifically drawing on the kind of productivity idea in the discussion, but certainly, yeah, you're right, what they were advocating for and why management might buy in was kind of underpinned by, by that productivity idea. And a lot of these, like, so the brewery example and other examples were about investing in new forms of technology, you know, which Industrial relations systems have very little limited connection to productivity, but new technology has a strong link to productivity. Um, so, founded more in fact, I guess, than the current debate around productivity in Australia, too, yes. Anything else? Yes, Danny. Yeah, I guess just to back on to Tim's question, if you're bringing some of these initiatives on your lot of claims, you sit down at the bargaining table. Mm. How do we convince the employers to care? <laughs> <laughs> How do you convince the employers to like, care about the new Obviously, from an academic perspective, you know, what, what can we throw at them? Yeah, um, I think um, there's a few different ways. So I think the, the discussion around productivity um, 
evidence uh, around um, you know workforce engagement and participation, uh, problem solving. Um, in Australia, you could argue, but I feel like this they might not take this seriously, is that you know climate um, requirements um, are going to be legislated and organisations are going to have to do something. Um, whether that actually happens, of course, is another question. So, you know, in the European context, I think employers have been more willing to sit down because they can see these, these frameworks around um, reporting your emissions, those sorts of things which are legally required, and therefore then, you know, they want to have that conversation. In the Australian context, that hasn't been the case, so the pressure or the using that as a potential leverage is pretty difficult. Um, yeah, and to be honest with you, thinking about my own union, um, the NTU, they've been pushing some of this stuff for well over a decade. And it's, you know, when you have a log of claims and there's 75 things on your log of claims and one of them is sort of two or three of them are green clauses, they're pretty, they're pretty easily mm -hmm. drawn off the table when it comes down to wages and work hours and workload and things like that, which I completely understand. So it is, on the member side and the union side, it's a, it's a, it can be a difficult sell as well. It's not mm -hmm. just management you're trying to convince yes. around these issues. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah, um, thanks for that, Caleb. Um, I came in a bit late, but I recently, um, we were, I um, received a lecture at uni about particularly ESG concerns of corporations yeah. um, generally and how that more and more and more that the boards are coming to the party on trying to look at these issues yeah. because the market's starting to shift incrementally mm. in that direction. Do you think that there is something to have a <coughs> synergies between both employees and corporations, particularly the boards, and trying to get these climate clauses into agreements? Yeah to address the ESG concerns that the corporation is going to have to actually seem to be doing quite conventionally. Yeah, definitely. I think um, there's a there's sort of the wider social context and the wider social pressure on organisations um, sort of expressed through ESG now, previously CSR. Um, I guess the problem is, and why I think the green some of those green clauses are more useful than others, is that um, what I see as more useful clauses in terms of unions is um, clauses that give you rights, which kind of um, pull a bit away from management prerogative to make more decisions without engaging their workforce. So um, that's always the issue, I think. So the board might think ESG is really important, but they don't give two shits what their workers think about what they should do about ESG. You know, so it's about trying to enforce that aspect of it. I guess that's the challenge. And again, it's, and it's, I think different industries and different organisations are in very different circumstances around those issues as well. Yeah. Um, I might just move on because I know I'm conscious of time, but I just want to talk a little bit about just transition, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Some people have been moving to think it's a dirty word, others are happy to use the words. But, um, and as I said, I'm talking about them kind of distinctly, but uh, underwriting sometimes just transition actions are certainly, you know, uh, clauses um, as well. So, um, so it's an approach that comes out of the union movement in the United States, dating back to the 1970s, uh, but has become much more commonly used probably since the early 2000s. And I know you've all probably read the Paris Climate Agreement, but it's actually in the Paris Climate Agreement where it's just transition. So, um, it's this idea that um, workers, communities um, who um, are impacted by the shift to a green economy shouldn't disproportionately um, bear the brunt of that change, essentially. And right at the bottom there, there's sort of three commonly agreed principles of just transition. The first is recognition, so recognition in terms of um, particular workers and communities and industries are going to be most impacted, and we have to recognise that too, is that those industries, workers and communities should participate in the transition design, planning and rollout. And then finally, a uh, redistribution of, um, so that's not just necessarily financial redistribution, in the, you know, loss of income, early retirement packages, which is often part of the conversation, but also offering uh, training, um, state support for new industries, um, you know, redistribution in many different forms, not necessarily just as sort of a wages or redundancy uh, discussion. Uh, again, if you're really interested in these things, there's a um, Leeds Business School has a few podcasts on Just Transition that you can uh, 
listen to if you're a bit nerdy like me. So that's the kind of general idea of what just transition is. Of course, the lived reality of just transition often can be uh, far from that. But what I thought I would do is give you the best practice. Now, you know, of course, it's Germany or it's a Nordic country that does these things well. Um, so uh, the Ruhr district in uh, Germany um, is widely considered to have the most success successful just transition plan uh, that it rolled out uh, globally where it shut down its coal powered generation and in coal mines and also other heavy industries that relied upon it over um, 30 plus years. Now, I think what's happened a little bit with this case is that history has been rewritten a little bit. So the impetus for this transition or just transition it was not environmental issues, but it was about economics, unsurprisingly, and it certainly did have nothing to do with climate change initially. Um, but it sort of got became that way in the in the two thousands. But the key features of, of the German just transition first principle, again, very kind of German industrial relations, is that you know, and this wasn't debated. This is just how it is. Um, government, industry, and unions sat down and tried to thrash out what would shutting this industry look like over a 30 year time horizon? What supports would we need? What does the industry want out of it? What does the union want out of it? And what's the government willing to put up, right? And, and that's how um, industrial relations in Germany is often uh, played out. Um, the planning, as I said, ran for decades. This wasn't something that, you know, they announced in uh, 1995 and said, you know, all coal would be shut down by 2000 or anything like this. This is decades long. There was huge government support, both at the state and federal level, um, many billions of euros. And um, as part of the process, because it had this long lead time, they were able to develop new industries, new manufacturing industries, new training hubs. Um, and the big thing that everyone likes to say about this case is that no one um, has had to go through a force redundancy in the um, 50,000 or so uh, workers who have moved out of the industry over that uh, time. Now the point on the screen is really important because I get a bit sick sometimes. I've seen other academics be like, oh, we just have to do what's in Germany. You know, they did it so successfully. But the reality is we do not live in Germany. We live in a neoliberal industrial relations environment in the Australian context where unions, industry and government don't often sit around the table and collaboratively figure things out. Um, we don't have high levels of unionisation like they do in the German context. We, have, we live in a very different world. So to say, let's just replicate what they did in Germany is not, I think, a very helpful you know, discussion. Like It's a good case study to look at and think, look, that would be amazing, but how could we do that in the context we actually live in, not pretend that we can somehow become a Nordic country or a German industrial relations country. So that's the kind of happy picture of German uh, just transition program. What do we know about what's been happening um, in Australia? So I did my PhD on the Australian automotive industry um, and then it closed down yeah. two years later. So <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not, maybe not the best career move. But, um, you know, what we know from the shutdown of, of the automotive industry in Australia is that we've seen persistent long-term under and unemployment amongst those workers who lost their jobs in South Australia. Uh, and Victoria in particular. Um, a more recent study and a kind of more recent, maybe and more applicable to thinking about just transition and, and climate change, uh, a study looking at coal workers in the Latrobe Valley in Victoria um, saw uh, a huge decrease in average earnings uh, for workers who lost their job and found uh, you know, other job opportunities in the Latrobe Valley. So a huge drop off in uh, earnings for those workers. And this was brought to my attention by a colleague at Sydney University, and I know we don't live in the 1940s, um, but I thought it was just an interesting example of where government state intervention in the Australian context um, was enormous, like huge. You know, so how many people work in the Australian coal industry? Maybe 50,000 tops um, in 12 months after the war ending, uh, 600,000 former soldiers were placed into employment. So, you know, it's that question of will and um, having the right settings to achieve those things. So, um, is anyone here from the AMW? No. Well, that's, that makes my life easier. I know we've double checked. I think I'm about to say. <laughs> so, um, I've been doing this project in Collie in uh, Western Australia. 
I'm sure you're all familiar with that, so I won't go into to outlining, um, you know, when I present it to students at UWA, they're like, golly, don't know, I don't know that place. Um, but, uh, <laughs> so just to give you an example, um, it, so obviously it's the only place we have coal mining and coal-fired power generation in Western Australia. And what's interesting is why we got involved at looking at coal mining is we looked at what was happening in the Latrobe Valley, the, the Hunter, um, less so the Bowen Basin, but particularly New South Wales and Victoria, and these really disorderly transitions in very short time frames and really bad outcomes for workers and communities. And um, Collie uh, and the unions involved there were trying to do something uh, different. Um, and I think that's interesting. So the coal-fired power stations are all scheduled to close by 2029. Um, one of the first units has already shut in that process and more um, some more are shutting this year, and obviously the two coal mines associated with it are also going to be shut down. So, um, again, this is um, probably more academic here, but I did get to go inside the coal fired power station, which was um, pretty cool. Uh, and we've been interviewing workers, um, delegates, union officials, government, employers, all sorts of different people. And the reason I asked about the MWU is because they're an industry partner on the project. So, uh, yes. Um, they gave us some money to help us do the research, basically. So, um, again, you might know a lot of this information, so I don't want to um, you know, repeat things you already know, but the Just Transition Working Group, you know, the Australian version maybe of the German model of bringing industry, employer and government around a table to discuss, but in this case it kind of is a broader, bigger group. So it's the state government and state departments, it's the unions, so not just the NWU, the ETU, uh, Mining and Energy, ASU, I think that's all the unions involved. SSTU. SSTU, sorry. Typhoon, the typhoon. Yes, 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 thank you. <laughs> Correct me when I get things wrong, please. Um, and um, employers, so the mines, Synergy, etc., as well as local government and some local reps. Um, in 2018, Synergy signed an MOU uh, with the unions uh, saying that they would accept the idea of a just transition and would seek to roll it out in consultation with the union and their workforce. Now there's been some um, fights around that, the most significant of which was Synergy didn't want to include contractors. Um, and here, you know, classic industrial relations issues are really important and at play, right? So, you know, we've got this, you know, fractured workforce where we have direct employees and we have contractors. Many of the contractors have worked there for well over a decade. Um, they weren't included in the transition plan um, because they weren't employees of Synergy and the unions had to have a big fight around that. So you can see how even when you're trying to implement a just transition and the employer seems relatively supportive and the state government's supportive, classic industrial relations issues surface and you know some workers get some things and other workers don't and obviously it comes back to questions of money and those sorts of things. Anyway, Eventually, the contractors did get included through a strategy that the unions deployed against the uh, employer. Um, and uh, the state government has um, put a fairly significant amount of money in, not nothing like what we saw in the German context, but nevertheless fairly significant to try and diversify, as well as offer retraining, the, the TAFE that's located in Collier, and those sorts of uh, things. So, am I going for time? I'm running out of time quickly, but I'll, I'll quickly move on. Um, so we came into the study and we looked at it and we had all this information and we were like, ah, it seems all very rosy, like, you know, the workers have, you know, embraced it, state government's, you know, supportive, I mean, some of the, main, some of the major employers are, are keen. And uh, we thought that's, it seems like a pretty easy case of transition. And then I did a quote with, um, a quote, an interview with Steve McCartney and, um, and he told me this story, which I thought was quite um, illustrative, both of the change that the unions had to go through over quite a long period of time, but also the change that the community had to go through. And to be fair, once I started interviewing union members and workers, you know, there's a variety of perspectives around just transition, and certainly some are not supportive, um, some are, and then there's people who are, you know, they're not that, they don't, care about the words just transition but they, they care about their community and work opportunities and those sorts of things so that was a really important point to sort of draw me back to thinking about well these things take 
you know, decades to achieve and change, cultural change in the union, change amongst the, the community, the members, the delegates, um, is really as big a challenge and barrier to achieving transition um, as, as many others. So now, um, thinking back sort of 15 years to, to now the early 2020s, um, we have, broadly speaking, the unions, um, the mining energy union, which compared to the East Coast, really different attitude. Um, so the question is what happened? And um, again, just a few quotes um, from, from different unions involved in the just transition. And these are more about change amongst the perception of the union themselves. And, and um, the Wayne's quote from the ASU I thought was really interesting about um, he'd been to Albany and seen what happened with the shutdown of the whaling industry there and was reflecting on the shutdown of the coal industry. And, and the idea that if we didn't engage and, and, and try and create a change in the community, um, the unions and the workers would just be in a museum one day and no one would remember what they were and what they did. So I thought that was a really powerful point. But kind of more strategically, and I'll just focus on the left-hand side of the screen, the, the approach from the unions um, and was, I mean, and some things are in their favour, obviously. So within the power stations and to some degree the, the coal mines, uh, sites are still fairly highly unionised compared to the, the Australian average. There's a number of delegates um, and they're younger, many of them. Um, they have families, they live in the community and they really want to keep coal thriving and growing and job opportunities in Coley, right? So there's a, a real commitment amongst the delegates and many of the members there around this issue. Um, the unions were really good at um, pressuring at a political level um, and government departments through those monthly meetings of the Just Transition Working Group to push their agenda and the things that they wanted to achieve. And because, uh, has anyone who's been to Collie, who's been spent time in Collie, Col I, I don't know if I'd ever been to Collie before I started this recent project, to be honest. But Collie localism, I mean, I lived in country, I've lived in country towns, Collie localism is strong, like it is in many um, country communities, and that is actually a really powerful resource, right? So drawing, drawing upon that, um, getting, you know, community meetings, go meetings going, um, to getting people who have power at those meetings to have to listen to the complaints and needs and wants of the community is a really powerful strategy. Um, so that was key to the union strategy as well. Now, they've been very successful in setting up the Just Transition Framework, getting some government support, but there is still a lot uh, that has not you know, happened or that needs to happen. So the success in setting up those MOUs, getting state support, getting the community engaged, getting the delegates engaged, etc. But, you know, many of the questions we were asked, and I think it's a very valid question, is, you know, what are we transitioning to? Transition to what problem, right? And, um, you know, what is the big industry or industries that have kind of come to town? And that still is up for discussion. Um, so that's where I can see a transition that's currently looking successful not being successful if that doesn't happen. And that's going to require state intervention and support and all those sorts of things. So I don't want to present colleagues like some great example, but they've got some of the bits right so far, whether or not it ends up being a successful example of transition in the Australian context rather than the German context uh, is a question um, that we haven't answered yet. Have you said that issue of when these jobs become redundant, there's normally a pay differential. Yeah. Means of lower paying, potentially less skilled jobs. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so so the biggest battery now, I'm probably getting this wrong, the biggest battery in the southern hemisphere is currently being built in colleagues. There's lots of construction jobs, well paid construction jobs there. Um, after it's constructed, there are eight jobs. I think Four of them are security jobs. Can you imagine the pain conditions there? Yep. And then I think the other four are like mowing the lawns and maintenance. Again, low pay. So that that actually quite pissed off the workers in in that announcement, as you can imagine. But the the one that's looking the most promising is green steel. Um, 
pursuing um, green steel smeltery in Collie. Um, they have, but it's still, it's not locked in. Um, they're, they're talking to the various unions, that's the most promising, and they do have fairly comparable paying conditions for the power station workers who are kind of doing that kind of work. Um, that's maybe 250 jobs, but if you think about the coal mines and the power stations, we're looking at, you know, over 1,500 workers, right? So it's a good start, but again, it's not going to create that transition. It's not just a pay differential, it's also a question of scale is totally different yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, you know, when you talk to young workers, they're, they're like, I'm just, I'm, I mean, I get it. Coley is probably not where they're going to say, I want to spend the next 10 years of my life, they want to go and do other things, but it's particularly um, probably workers between 30 and 50 most worried. Once we're 50, you're thinking about with a greater time package, hopefully, and that sort of thing. So it's a, there's different tensions between the words and how they think about these things as, as well. It's uh, probably not helpful, and I hope this reality has changed since the last time I spoke to my colleague, Ramona, the top organiser about this. But the yeah. last I heard, and admittedly it was late last year, I'll have to ask her again, the TAFE was looking to run courses in hairdressing, aged care, and business management. Yeah. Um, that tells me a lot about what they think is going to happen in the college. Yeah. And it worries me a bit. Yeah, and that's, so um, whenever state government or someone talks about tourism, um, mm -hmm. that also upsets the community as well. Um, yeah, so this you can see those things definitely, those tensions playing out. Um, so I know I'm short on time, so I'll just finish up really quickly. So in terms of other options for pushing climate action by uh, industrial relations, <coughs> sorry, um, the closing the loopholes bill might help. You're like, why would that help, Caleb? Um, I think the revaluing of work that can happen potentially under the closing the loopholes bill is one step towards um, lifting up the paying conditions of industries that are lower environmental impact and is good for the climate. Um, like considering value and gender, as the Fair Work Commission now must do, I wonder if climate should also be a core objective. And another consideration is, uh, as I've mentioned, I think multiple times, Melton Unions, the fossil fuel industry, have been a pace setter for wages and conditions in this country and in many other countries. So we need to think about how we create pace setters in the green economy as well as other parts of the economy and I've listed a few examples there. And then I am concluding. So we need actions from the bottom up, green bargaining, OHS committees, getting memorandums of understanding, even though I know they're not that useful, engaging members training, but we also need comprehensive actions from the top down. So those are things like state support for transition programs, obviously large amounts of government investment, um, high levels of union coordination, um, new regulations, and empowering IR institutions when it comes to climate issues and industrial relations. So, uh, thank you, and um, thanks for having me at your conference. Appreciate it.